Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I'm Quinn Wisson from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting our monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, How to Map Content to Your Buyer's Journey, and will be presented by our special guest, Michael Brenner. If you don't already know Michael, he is the CEO of Marketing Insider Group and has been working in leadership, marketing, and sales roles for nearly 20 years. He also travels around the country teaching on content marketing at numerous conferences and events. I do have just a couple of notes to mention before we get started. Today's webinar will be available for viewing by tomorrow. We will send out an email to everyone with a link to both the recording and the slides so you can watch it, review it, and also share it with your team. We'll also be happy to answer any of your questions. So if you take a peek at your webinar interface, you'll see a little question applet where you can send anything you'd like me to ask Michael afterwards. Also, instead, you can tweet along or ask questions that way. We're using a hashtag today. It's VM Webinar. If you have any technical problems, usually just signing off and signing back on fixes it. Otherwise, just let me know. I think those are all my notes, so I am happy to hand it off to our presenter, Michael Brenner. Hey everyone, and thanks so much, Quinn. Um, you said it was 77 degrees there in Phoenix. That's making me a little bit ill. Sorry. Uh, when I woke up this, yeah, when I woke up this morning, it was 22 degrees, and the feel like temperature was seven degrees. I don't uh, know what that would be like. Sorry. <laughs> it's brutal. It's brutal. And the good news is, it's two o'clock here on the East Coast, which means I'm closer to happy hour than you. Oh, are, perfect. So, um, so there's, you know, always a silver lining. But thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and thanks to everyone who joined and and registered and. Um, uh, for this, I think, really important topic of how to map content to the buyer journey. You know, and, it, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking and writing and speaking and, and workshopping with clients and brands on, on how to be successful with content marketing. And I have a secret to content marketing success, a simple secret to content marketing success. But, but before we get to that, I think we need to set a little bit of context. So let me do that first. Um, Content today, and, and you, we all know and we all feel this, we're all consumers, we're all people, we're all on our phones and checking Facebook and looking at Instagram and posting photos and, and tweeting and chatting and, and checking emails, and, and so there's a ton of content today. In fact, uh, one of the most recent stats is that every single minute of the day, more than four days of video uh, content is uploaded. So literally more content is being created than we could consume, than, than any one person could consume. Um, and so that's creating all this competition for our attention as, as consumers. Uh, so in order to break through the noise, you know, we really have to think about the content we create um, as competing with the kinds of things that, that unfortunately so many of us, or maybe fortunately, so many of us are really tied into. Pictures of kittens and babies and puppies. And, and so if you're a dog person, I have uh, one, uh, uh, my favorite image of, of, of dogs here. This is four pugs looking pensively. They're, they're really trying to figure out what is the secret to content marketing, marketing success. Um, if you're a cat person, here's two kittens cuddling. They've already figured out the secret, so um, they're pretty happy and just, just kind of living it up and enjoying themselves. So, so the bottom line though is that I believe that content marketing is an imperative and the reason for that is that content marketing offers us the opportunity to earn your audience's attention um, because what's the alternative, right? The alternative is buying or interrupting it. Um, I'm certainly not interested, I've never been interested in trying to buy an audience. The moment I stop spending money, the audience I'm trying to buy goes completely, it, it completely disappears. I'm also not interested in interrupting my audience. As a consumer, I hate being interrupted with promotional ads for products I would never consider. Um, and so there's kind of an inherent ROI in the objective or the, or the sort of state statement and the belief that content marketing is an imperative, um, it offers us an opportunity to earn our audience's attention, but ultimately from a business perspective, it offers us the opportunity to present a better return on investment. And so let's let's go back and kind of take a walk down memory lane. This is 1994. I actually had graduated about a year before from college, and and this is the very first banner ad. 1994. The commercial web was really only a year old old at this point. Um, and so the first banner ad. We marketers, I think Seth Godin said, marketers ruin everything. Um, and so the first banner ad was created, and it was actually a banner ad talking about stories. It was AT and T, and they said, "Have you ever clicked your mouse right here? You will." And when 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 people clicked on this ad, they were actually 
taken to a series of stories by AT&T on what this the future world would look like since uh, with us all being connected and sharing information online and they really imagine sort of this this uh, this amazing future uh, with uh, technology enabling us to connect and tell stories 46% of the people who saw this ad 46% of the people who saw this ad clicked through to see those stories um, since then, we've seen this this precipitous decline in click-through rates. In fact, the 46% doesn't even fit on the chart, right? So um, this is just at 2,000. So in six years, we went from 46% to about 10%. Um, in the last 15 years, we've gone from 10% to almost absolute zero, um, zero percent. Uh, click-through rates in banner ads. In fact, um, the data suggests that you're more likely to be struck by lightning, to give birth to twins, to, to survive, not to die, but to survive a plane crash um, or win the Powerball than you are to have someone click on your banner ad. In fact, um, recently I saw an article, uh, this guy in Dubai, um, he survived a plane crash and a week later won the lottery. So, so this is what we're hoping for. We're actually hoping for lightning to strike strike twice, if you will, um, when we do things like digital display and banner advertising. And so what's the ROI of this kind of interruptive, traditional type of, of, of marketing, right? Uh, banner ads are really just um, traditional advertising moved into a digital medium. Um, and what's the ROI? 0.06% uh, is the average click-through rate of display ads. Um, of those clicks, 10% are actually by robots, and if you're talking about mobile display ads, 50% are completely accidental. Um, so there's all these stats that we can, you know, we can bash um, digital display and banner ads. I often say that if content marketing is the hero of the marketing story, then uh, banner ads are the villain, if you will. Um, but this is a, a really a larger message, and the larger message is encapsulated, I think, in this research done by the Advertising Research Foundation. Ironically, what they found was that after a, a few dozen, so about three dozen ad exposures, just around 40 was the number, it differs by product category, but on average it's about 40 ad exposures where they started to see sales decline. And so I'll give you an example. If you watch, uh, if you watch a, an NFL football game on Sunday, you might see 40 ads from one advertiser in the course of one football game. And so 40, num 40 is the number where, where consumers start to actually consider your brand less if advertising is the approach that we take. So, so we can buy and try to interrupt our audience's content experience, or we can create the kinds of content that people actually want. Now again, there's a larger problem here. Marketing has a marketing problem. If you think about, you know, if you ask the people that you know that aren't in marketing or maybe aren't in business even, you know, doctors and lawyers and your dentist, what do they think marketing is? They're probably going to talk about, you know, ads in Times Square or logos on the side of a bus or a football stadium or, you know, even even worse, they might think of it as sort of sales. And and when people explain marketing to me, they don't they don't explain this kind of you know helpful relationship building type sales or um, uh, uh, sort of feeling they they describe it as something insidious and evil and trying to marketing is trying to trick people to buy something they wouldn't normally need and so marketing has a marketing problem and I think we've created this problem as marketers um, because of the most evil creation in the history of business the autoplay video ad right so these are the kinds of things that if you see one and you're listening to it and you're looking for your for your mute button and it, and certain publishers and, and I'm not going to name names because it's really not completely their fault um, they're only doing what they're getting paid for but but certain publishers like the one that you might recognize here um, you'll be forced to read uh, click through four pages to read a single story and the same video ad will autoplay on each click through on the continue to reading an article and so this is why marketing has a marketing problem we've created this problem our audience just wants it to stop. This is how we feel as consumers. And don't worry, Holly's fine. Uh, she survived this terrible incident um, during a storm. But this, I think, encapsulates how our audience feels. And so the buyer journey doesn't start with a search for your product. If we're going to create content mapped to the buyer journey, we have to realize and we have to sell in the idea. We have to gain executive buy-in to the idea that the buyer journey doesn't start with a search for your product. The buyer journey um, has been mapped in serious decisions seven or eight years ago, said it was 56%. Salesforce has updated that more recently and said it's now 90% of the buyer journey, specifically here in B2B. Um, and, and, and we see this across just about any different product category. 90% of the buyer journey is, is, is completely self-directed 
before your your prospects are going to reach out and often in the B2B case it's going to be for a contract and a price there's no negotiation there's no there's no relationship building that happens buyers are self educating on the solutions that are available to them to find out the best way to solve their problem and and the the position that we have as vendors is often just hey what's your price and what's your contract and what features and and benefits and and what customer testimonials do you have that support and 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 validate the decision that I've already made. So if all you do is promote your products with interruptions and ads, you're missing the majority of that buyer journey. You're missing the majority of buyers overall and we can quantify that. So we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in and be and create and publish and, and provide experiences that attract people based on what they are interested in. So this is my simple definition of content marketing. I think everything in life can be explained in a Venn diagram. So this is mine for content marketing. Um, on the left you see everything that we typically produce as, as brands. It's the stuff that we have traditionally created, um, not just for 20 years since the dawn of the web, but, but even going all the way back to, from, to the time of the very first business, we've created a relatively standard and consistent set of content. On the right hand side is what customers are looking for. And so when we think about what your company creates, it probably looks a little bit like this. It's who we are, what we sell, why we're better. And it's our, I, I think it's important to understand that that's our natural instinct. It's the natural instinct of an executive, of a product person, and often that pressure falls down and, and, and even is felt um, very personally by marketers who feel that it's their job to talk about who we are, what we sell, and why we're better. But the point of the Venn diagram is that most of that content doesn't overlap at all with the things that your customers are looking for. Now, what your customers are looking for might look like pictures of kittens and babies and puppies, uh, you know, like this puppy here. And so that's just pure charity. So content marketing isn't doing the thing on the right. It's also about not just doing the thing on the left, but about finding the kind of messages, telling the kinds of stories that show your audience that you care about them. Um, it often looks like sharing the expertise that you have, the things that you know more than the things that you sell. So content marketing can attract an audience when we when we embody this empathy that's required required to understand what our customers are looking for and then apply that to the stuff that we know. So content marketing is the overlap between what we typically create or what we know and what our customers are looking for, not what we sell. Okay, so a few very simple examples that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, imagine that you own the target audience. Imagine that your company owned a publication that directly served the target audience that you're trying to reach, like Adobe does with CMO.com, trying to truly own and, and, and at very minimum just contribute to the conversation that CMOs are having, acting like a publisher. Imagine marketing that attracts new buyers and uh, you know American Express is often cited as a great example of content marketing. I think you know there's a couple of things that are interesting about American Express um, but the most important thing is that this is the largest source of, of revenue for their small card division, the largest source of new card holders for their small card division. So think about, imagine that you were the owner of the program that drove more leads and sales than any other marketer, than any other program across your organization. Imagine the power and, and the, the joy that you, that would bring. Um, and the reason that content marketing works is because I think we often forget the way that we consume and discover content online. So this is actually a chart of uh, by co-marketing associates of the stuff that works um, best for for marketers. It's also completely representative of the the most common ways that we find content. So most people spend their money on third-party media sites and events and digital display and you know we all got to get on the mobile platforms and and yet 90% of all content is discovered with search, email, and social. It's organic discovery of content through search through social and through emails, through brands and publishers that we have opted in to receive their content from. So it is organic discovery through three primary platforms, search, email, and social. All of these platforms are driven not by ads, but by content, by stories, by the kinds of content that map to your customer's journey. And then another thing that I, I can't believe is still sort of a, 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 a misunderstood uh, uh, insight into what content marketing really is. Um, there's a difference between marketing with content and content marketing. If you create an ebook and you push it out on your social channels, that's not 
content marketing. Um, if you uh, create an ad and throw it up on Facebook, even if that ad is a native ad that you might put on a publisher, that's not content marketing, that's marketing with content. The difference between marketing with content and content marketing is a digital destination that you own, and this has so many implications that we'll get to in a minute. Um, I think this is so important that I often lead with examples I've shown, shown you just two very quickly, um, but because I think it's so important, just about a year ago I created 106 examples of brand-owned content marketing destinations, owned media, um, companies of every size, in, in every corner of the world, um, in every different industry, um, for-profit, non-profit, healthcare, uh, B2B, B2C, um, no matter what kind of business you're in, there's an example uh, that I think you can find, and hopefully you'd find it here, um, on uh, brand-owned content marketing destinations. Uh, by the way, I tested 106 brand-owned content marketing destinations as a title, and um, it, it didn't work very well, and when I changed it to 99 plus, um, it sort of took off, so that's why it's called 99 plus brand-owned content marketing destinations. But there's a, a link, if, if I'll go back real quick. If you want to take a screenshot, there's a link at the bottom for you to check that out. Okay, so the bottom line is that we create all of this content that never gets used, right? If you remember the left-hand side of my Venn diagram, and I think we understand part of the reason marketing has a marketing problem, part of the reason we do stuff that we know doesn't work is because there's an executive who asked us to do it. Now, the point of this is not to say that we should point fingers uh, at, the, at the CEO or our boss and blame them for the marketing that we do that doesn't work. I think we're all accountable as marketers for pushing back and, 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 and creating the business case, creating the insights, creating, an, if, if needed, the fear in the minds of our executives to understand that if we don't market in the way that your buyers are, are looking to be marketed to, if we don't map content directly to the buyer's journey, um, then we're simply going to be stuck in this situation of creating content no one wants, trying to buy and trying to interrupt our audiences. Okay, I mentioned that there was a secret. Okay, so there is a secret to content marketing success. I don't believe content marketing is as hard as some people make it out to be. I don't believe it has to be that expensive. Most companies don't have a content problem. The, the, the simple secret to content marketing success is that the buyer journey is nothing more than a series of predictable questions that you have the you have the authority, the expertise, the knowledge, and the passion already bottled up inside your company to answer those important questions. The secret to content marketing success is mapping content to the buyer journey based on knowable, definable, quantifiable questions that your audience is already asking. So how do we do that though when 60 to 70 percent of the marketing we create goes completely unused? How do we do that when the boss asks us to go throw our logo on the side of a bus. Well, behind every piece of bad content is an executive who asks for it, so we need to show them the business case, right? Um, define, do a content audit. I've done about five of these. It was pretty painful, I have to say. Um, I'm sure Vertical Measures has done this and, and, is, and it loves to do this for all of their clients. Um, I certainly don't, but when it's done, and I, like I said, I've done it um, for, about 50, uh, for about five or six different clients, and what we found was that on average, 70% of the content that marketers created went completely unused. That's not that it was created and didn't work. It was created and never used. Why does this happen? The sales team asked us for a brochure to take to an event. You print it out, you spend the money, you create the piece of content, it ships and it sits in a stack at the booth in the event. Or maybe your prospect takes it and throws it straight into the bin. We create content, not that doesn't get that, that gets used and doesn't work, we create content that never gets used because we haven't defined the importance and the business case behind mapping content to the buyer journey. How much content do you create that never gets used? Um, and look at how much you're investing in that kind of content. What do you spend on paid search? Because uh, you don't rank organically. And, and so, you know, here's just an example on, on cloud computing. And it was one I used when I was at SAP. Um, SAP was, was moving um, big time into uh, the whole conversation around cloud computing with, with lots of product support and new product development. And yet, uh, all of the competition was beating us in, the, in, the, in sort of the battle for organic ranking. And so, you know, the easy answer is to just go spend on paid search. But yet the, the 
simple secret is that mapping content to the buyer journey um, can allow you to rank organically for the search terms your audience uses. To build the business case you can look at, what do you spend per click on paid search and imagine if you got that same traffic for free organically. Use a portion of that budget to create content map to the buyer journey. Um, my favorite exercises with CMOs, um, when they push back and they ask me, well, what's the ROI of content marketing? I say, well, what's the ROI of your marketing overall? Um, most of them don't know. And, and in a few instances, I've been able to sit down and I've asked them to just pull up their CRM uh, uh, system, run a report, really rank it on anything. If they have an ROI report, that's great. But a lot of times it's just, hey, let's rank it on leads. Let's rank it on sales if you have it. Let's just rank it on on um, really you know any metric that you're able to measure consistently. Every time I've done it, 30, 40, 50% of the marketing campaigns that that CMO allowed his team to invest in produced zero results. Not low results, zero results. Take those things that didn't work last year and apply these, these thoughts and these ideas to mapping content to the buyer journey, creating an owned platform, a, a platform that you own that maps content to the buyer journey. You can quantify this. This is why L'Oreal owns Makeup.com. L'Oreal realizes that there are more people searching for makeup than are searching for L'Oreal. So L'Oreal went and built and bought the domain Makeup.com. They use Makeup.com as a publishing platform to provide tips and tricks and the latest trends in makeup. And and of course they link to their own products. Um, so I, I, you know, I would say um, appropriately. Some sites do it inappropriately. They do it appropriately only once they've delivered something of value to the audience of people that are typing makeup into their browser. This is why you can quantify this for your own company. How many people search for the category of your solution versus search for your company or your brand name? How many of that larger group of people, right? See, see the large, so there's about you know, 10, 15 times more people searching for makeup. How many of those people searching for the category of your solution are finding their way to your website? For most of the brands that I work with, it's less than 1%. Less than 1 in 10,000 of the, of the visitors coming to your website are coming from early stage unbranded search. What this means is that everyone that finds you on your website is typing your company name into their Google browser. They already know who you are. They're already through that 90% of the buyer journey and they're reaching out to you to get in touch with a salesperson to get a contract or a price or maybe to find a job, but these are not the people that are going to buy from you. You can look at the search terms that that are um, that you're that you're ranking for, and what you want to look for is you want to look for how many unbranded search terms are you ranking for. So you can see this is a, actually an image of of my website, uh, Marketing Insider Group, from about a year ago, um, a little over a year ago. And what you can see is I rank for content marketing and B two B marketing and thought leadership and slide shares and social media and marketing strategies. And oh by the way, I rank for the word sleazy. So the reason I rank for the word sleazy is I wrote a post called Marketing Has a Marketing Problem and I used that exact image and the alt image tag was sleazy. <laughs> so I now rank for when people look for sleazy, which is just fine because I want them to find that there is a solution to this problem that marketing has. Um, but you can see I don't rank for Michael Brenner or Marketing Insider Group. I rank for the terms that my audience is using when they're looking for a solution and you can do that same analysis. So. Here is an actual answer to the secret. The questions that your buyers are asking follow a relatively predictable and quantifiable um, series of, 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 of actions and questions. Um, in almost every pro product category, your audience is starting with the what is question or what is this thing and why is this thing important? If you're, if you're uh, an analytics company selling big data solutions, well, what is big data? Why is big data analytics important? Um, there's about a hundred people that are asking that question for every one person who's actually interested in what it is that you sell. Um, and then we move into another stage, the middle stage, where we're looking to get a little bit deeper. How do I how do I do this thing? Um, when should I look to buy something that solves this problem? Is there somebody out there who looks like me, somebody in the same role or a similar company that has solved this problem? Um, people in the middle stage aren't looking for for customer testimonials. They're looking for profiles. They're looking for buyers like them that have solved this problem, not necessarily yet who they chose. And so for every one person searching for a product, there's 10 people in the middle stage. 
And so there are tools you can use. We promised that we'd give you some tips and tricks and tools. And so here's a few of the simple and easy, in some cases, in most cases, free tools um, that you can use. So just simply using Google autofill. It, you want to find out what marketers, what people think about marketing? Well, type marketers are into Google, and you'll see that the autofill thinks that most people think that marketers are liars or are from Mars, and they want to find out what we're interested in. And, you know, my favorite one there at the end is we're always trying to, quote, unquote, size up the millennials. You know, those, those darn millennials are tough to size up. And so this is what people think and search for when they search for marketers are. And so you can use tools like keyword tool dominator.com, ubersuggest.io, keyword tool.io is the one I use, um, that you can actually type in a keyword and it'll spit out all the questions that people are asking. Um, one of my new favorite tools is this um, awesome visualization of those questions. It's called Answer the Public. Um, this is actually a friend of Steve Rayson's who, who's a co-founder of BuzzSumo. I'll show you them in a second. Um, but here I typed in content marketing and I can see all of the, the most important questions people ask across e each of these who, what, when, where, why, and how um, questions. And so you could create and literally create a content um, map or editorial strategy around these questions. The secret to content marketing success success is mapping content to the buyer journey by answering the questions your customers are already asking. I mentioned BuzzSumo. You can do the same thing. Um, what BuzzSumo adds is it adds on a layer of what actually works, and, and it's using this proxy for what works based on the number of shares that a piece of content gets. But if you type in content marketing plan into BuzzSumo, you'll see all of the, um, the top articles uh, based on the total number of shares. Now, there's a couple of interesting things you can get from this. Um, you can understand what sites people go to. Marketing Land seems to be an important site for content marketing plans. You can see what topics people are interested in sharing. You can see what types of content, whether it's articles or infographics or or interactive quizzes or videos. Um, you can you can reverse engineer an editorial strategy based on what works when once you know the keywords that you're trying to target. Another free tool, this is probably my favorite one, um, is just simple Google Trends. Um, when I think about what do I want to write about on Marketing Insider Group, uh, is it content marketing or social media or native advertising, God forbid, or email marketing or digital marketing, um, I can see the relative size as well as the growth rates of each of these. And so for 2017, I want to talk a little bit more about digital marketing trends, and I'm certainly not going to talk about native advertising, and I'm going to continue to talk about email marketing and social media and content marketing, obviously. And, and so you can see that, again, the relative size as well as growth rates of different topics that you might be considering that are specific to your industry. So uh, first I want to talk about kind of quality and quantity. I wrote a, a, a sort of provocative post last Monday about um, the importance of more better content and, and um, the point of that post was that um, creating a great piece of content isn't enough. We have to create um, a certain quantity of it. Uh, it was a, it was an interesting point that I made. Some of the comments are, extended the conversation even more. I um, invite you to check it out. But the main point is that a lot of people think that you just have to focus on quality. This is why. This is an IBM number one search engine result for what is cloud computing. This landing page has about 40 words on it. And what's happening is Google will eventually catch on to these SEO optimized, um, you know, super hyperlinked, um, essentially black hatted. Uh, I'm sure IBM used white hat techniques, but, but the fact is that this is not the best answer on the internet. Uh, as my friend Andy Crestedina um, would say, this is not the best, um, the, the, the most comprehensive answer on the internet for the question, what is cloud computing? Google's going to catch on to that. They're going to start to put more and more weight on quality. They're going to look at social sharing as proxies. They're going to continue to look at inbound links, um, but Google's going to figure this out. And so if you're just using SEO and optimizing pages that look like this, you're going to ultimately lose because quality is always going to win, especially if we're looking at Google and the way that they change their algorithm. But like I said, quality isn't enough. So this is one of my favorite charts from HubSpot. They do this research every single year. Every year it's the same trend line. The more you publish, the more reach and conversions, and I want to focus on conversions. If you're looking for leads, you need to publish more. Now, it doesn't mean you need to publish more crap, and so I want to make that point very clear. You have to set a high bar of, quantity, of quality. You have to answer the questions that your audience is asking in the best way that you can, and then you need to set a, a consistent 
deadline. You need to, as my friend Andrew Davis says, make an appointment with your audience and consistently, and maybe for you once a week is enough, uh, and, and you can commit to doing that in a really good way. Those that make these commitments to publishing consistently, more better content, and that was the reason for the title of that post, more better is important, um, is you're going to see better results. And so you could ask, is this causation or correlation? Um, it's a really good question, and you're a smart person if you had that question. Um, it, it was posed to me, and I had never thought about it, so I, apparently I'm not smart enough to have thought about it. But I do think the answer is that it's, it's not causation. Publishing more alone isn't going to drive more results. It's the companies that commit to publishing more, I think, are also aligned to. They've, they've made that, that uh, um, they've, they've set that appointment with their audience. They've committed to creating quality content. And then they, they're doing, they're simply doing more tests. They have more data points to see what works. And so it's not the act of publishing more that drives more results. It's the result of, of publishing more that drives better results. And so just some, maybe some deep meta thoughts for you to consider there. So the importance of quantity and quality um, is, is, I think I can't um, understate enough. So how do we create content people actually want? If you look at most brands, what you're going to see, and you maybe you see this inside your own company, um, 80, 90, 95, maybe even 100% of all the content you create is product-specific content. It's for that one person who's really ready to buy, and yet there's 100 people who are asking early stage, what is, why is this important, how do I do it type questions. So we need to create 100 pieces of content for every one piece of product content, and that can take many different forms, articles and news and information graphics and, and quizzes and then you can think about you know maybe deeper investments into quality formats like videos and white papers and webinars and podcasts and how-to guides and even in the late stage we can create customer focused content think about the events that you invest in um, events are, are um, I would never say are a bad thing they're essentially just a deep investment in customer focused content um, newsletters and, and customer profiles not customer testimonials where we talk about um, a, a company that bought us and why, but a profile of who bought you and why. What What is it about them? Let them tell their story. That's what your audience is interested in. So this, I call this the Brenner Doctrine. I don't know. I've used that three or four times. It doesn't seem to stick, but this will be my last time trying it. The Brenner Doctrine is that for every one piece of content you create for your buyers, product-focused content, think about what it would be like. What, what would be the investment required and the commitment required to create a hundred pieces of early stage content for prospects, for people that aren't yet considering you, but are thinking about the problem that they have that relates to what you sell. And for every one piece of product content, could you create 10 pieces of middle stage content that really helps them educate on how to solve the problems that they have in various formats. So for every one piece of product content, create a hundred pieces of early stage content. Another question I get is, you know, personas, you know, we start we start with personas and we have seven personas and how much content should I create and should we map content to personas? And here's the thing, personas are great, except when they suck. And the reason I wrote this post is that I saw companies spending tens and even hundreds of thousands of dollars creating these deep, detailed persona documents with a huge thud factor. And the simple fact is they didn't answer the actionable questions of what content is your audience interested in, what channels do they use, what types and topics and, and, and things drive them to convert deeper down the funnel. Topics, types, and channels, if you don't answer those questions, your personas might not be as great as as the investment that you made in them. So I'm not against personas, I'm actually 100% for them as long as they're actionable and they answer basically what your audience is interested in. So here's another Venn diagram, right? On the left is a typical persona. It's demographics, firmographics. It's, you know, millennial Mary wakes up in the morning and the first thing she does is check her phone. Who cares? It doesn't help you decide how to map content to your buyer journey. But if you know that millennial Mary is interested in cats and that she's also an engineer and she works for a startup, well, you can start to create content that relates to people who are engineers, work at startups, and love cats. And so you often find that that when you focus on your audience's interests, it can be based in personas, but when you focus on your audience's interests, it can lead you into, into relatively surprising places. And that's why I said you're, you may find that your audience is interested in cats. And when you write about um, you know, seven things that engineers who love cats do when they wake up in the morning, um, you might find that that content really resonates and it shows your humanity and your personality. And it's exactly the kind of content that your audience is interested in. 
um, what about gating? Should we gate content? And this is, you know, more traditionally a B2B question. Um, if you don't know what gating means, it means should you put a lead form in front of your content? Almost every organization in B2B that I know has this debate internally. Um, and, and so, you know, again, if we think about mapping content to the buyer journey, and I'm focusing here just on the types of content, there are types of content that map relatively well to, to lead forms. The, the point though is that you have to first create that hundred pieces of early stage content. You have to attract your audience and earn their trust before you ask them to fill out a form to get your deeper pieces of content. So gating can be a good thing. Lead forms are a good thing. I think most B2B prospects and buyers are willing to give up their name and email address for the ultimate guide to your solution, for research reports, for book excerpts, for, a, for they're willing to register to a really compelling event or to hear tips from pros or predictions for the future. Um, but it only works when you first attracted your audience and earned their trust with purely customer focused content that maps to the questions that they're asking. Um, I want to just kind of, and, and we're going to move to here to questions in, in a minute. Um, I want to provide an example of a company that I think has done this really well. It's called The Content Loop, which is actually an ironic name because they've actually created a full customer content loop with this platform. And so the company is, is Capgemini, and it's my friend Lili Lepine who started, and, and, and I spoke to her about two years ago. And she actually started with this goal of trying to fix an awareness problem. Capgemini is the number four player in the consulting services market. They compete with Accenture and Deloitte and, and, and KPMG, all companies that love to throw their logos on stadiums and golfer hats and they have tremendous awareness and so Capgemini tried to solve this problem without sticking their logo on a stadium or a golfer's hat and so what they found in their research was that their target audience was hanging out on LinkedIn and there was a certain series of types of content that they were consuming so they did the persona work but their persona work identified the channels that they consume content the types of content and the topics that their audience was interested in so they created content-loop.com where they, they publish articles about two or three times a day that, that map to their audience's interests. They, they target that content directly to their target audience through LinkedIn sponsored updates. That drives their audience to land on Content Loop. They're gonna read an article that hopefully that engages them and then um, my friend Lili, she did a test and she thought, you know what, it might be interesting to have them connect with our experts. And so again, this was an awareness play. Um, she wasn't trying to drive uh, leads and she didn't gate content, but she did do this test with LinkedIn and, and they mapped a few experts. And so if you read a cloud computing article, you might see um, Remco Reinders here, uh, who's their practice leader for cloud computing and customer experience. And so after reading the article, it said, you might want to connect with Remco. And what they found was not only did they drive awareness, they got a million visitors in their first year they grew 3,000 new LinkedIn followers a week they they did get lots of high quality leads but what they stumbled upon this happy secret and success that they found was a million dollars in sales in the first year for an awareness play by mapping content to the buyer journey finding the channels that their audience was interested in publishing the content that met the buyers needs across the different stages of their buyer journey um, they they stumbled upon this amazing revenue source, a million dollars in sales the first year. I presented this case study a few weeks ago at a company, I won't name which company it was, where um, the engineer who actually built this site, content-loop.com, was he, he had moved on from Capgemini. He was in the audience and he came up to me and he said, you know, in our second year, with no incremental investment, we saw $24 million in sales. So imagine if you spent 1% of your marketing budget on a platform like this and it generated a million dollars in sales in the first year and 24 million dollars in sales in the second year. Imagine the, the rock star and the hero that you could be. There's a secret to content marketing success and it's as simple as mapping content to your buyer's journey, to answering the questions that they're looking to answer. So anyone can buy clicks and leads, right? But CEOs are demanding marketing that delivers a return on investment. So how do we show them the return on investment with content marketing. Well, I want to take you back to that point I made that content marketing is owned media. It's a platform that you own. It's a digital property. Think of it as your corporate blog or a microsite. It's a property, a digital property. It could be a print asset as well, but it's an asset that you own, a brand owned asset where you're publishing content. Native ads are not content marketing. They're ads because you're sending a piece of content to another publisher site. You don't own that traffic. You can't monetize that traffic. 
Native advertising can be an effective distribution platform for your brand-owned content marketing, but that's marketing with content. Content marketing requires a digital platform that you own. Once you do, it's an asset that has real value that you can quantify the growth over time. It's like your 401k. If you think about what do you do with your 401k or your retirement account, you take 3% or 6% or maybe 1% or maybe 10% of your salary every single paycheck and you throw it into your 401k. It's a consistent investment, small but consistent investment that adds up over time and not just adds up linearly, but it compounds. The returns you get compound over time. Your 401k portfolio would look exactly like this. It's a compounding rate of return. So this is a, a B2B client um, of mine that, that invested in a, a relatively small platform and program that they owned, a content marketing um, digital destination. They published about 40 articles uh, a month. So I want you to think about um, what would that look like for you? 40 articles every single month. They didn't, they didn't increase that really over time. They didn't decrease that over time. It was a consistent investment in creating content that answered their customers questions. But they didn't see um, a consistent return. They saw an accelerating return, a compounding return. The blue bars are the traffic that they saw. Well, we can't quantify traffic. The black line is leads. It's the revenue they were able to generate directly from leads that they achieved from their content marketing. So with a consistent investment in content marketing, they saw an accelerating rate of return, exactly like your retirement account. So this is one way that I think you can show your CEO that content marketing is an imperative. It's the only way for marketing to solve the marketing problem that we have. A consistent investment in this kind of marketing can produce an accelerating and compounding rate of return. So I think that's it for me. This, If you're looking to get a little bit more, more detailed, there is a simple roadmap for success. We have to keep in mind that marketing ROI is the number one objective for marketers in 2017. Content marketing is the only way to earn your audience's attention versus buying it or interrupting it. It's the only way to show an accelerating rate of return from marketing investments. The path to getting there is just documenting your marketing strategy, publishing content to that destination that you own, then you can start to get into these more mature types of tactics. You have to optimize for mid-stage offers and subscriptions, and, and then you can start to think about how do you distribute it effectively through uh, through earned media and paid media and measure the return on investment, investment and then ultimately optimize and target your distribution so that you can measure and show and demonstrate to the boss, to the CEO, to the CMO, and to your marketing peers that you own the, the, the marketing platform that delivers more ROI than any other marketing program inside your company. So that's it for me. We're going to move to questions. I want to thank you for your time and attention. Hopefully I've earned your trust in, in presenting some of these insights with you. Um, Taylor Swift is from my hometown. We didn't actually live in the same hometown because she was born the year that I left for college, but but we are from the same town and so she's our our, our most famous daughter. Um, and uh, and in, in her perennial words here, I love you guys and thank you for listening. Um, I do think we have time for questions, so I want to thank you again. Um, I'll turn it back over to you, Quinn. I think hopefully we have some questions yeah, for you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, you know, I teach a lot about content marketing as well, workshops and whatnot. And I love your presentation because it seems like we're speaking the same language, but just in different words. You know, we always say, how can you be the best answer on the end of someone's search, which is similar to kind of what you're talking about, about the questions and predictable questions that need to be answered. So this yeah. is great information. So I've got a couple of questions here. And if anyone has any more, feel free to send them right now so I could put them in the queue. Um, mm -hmm. So first question for you, Michael, is what are your thoughts on content saturation with multiple businesses answering the same questions? And how do you find differentiators to stand out on the SERPs? Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a, you know, there, there's, there, there has been some heated debate in our industry about it. And I'm, I'm not even going to get into it um, because I think um, – there, there's some context to it, and the context is that there was there's this theory of information overload um, that most people think is something that's a relatively modern um, concept, um, but in fact, information overload, it, without that name, um, but the theory of information overload was first articulated by uh, someone who um, 
reacted to the, uh, the invention of the printing press. And he thought, now that we have a printing press, there's going to be so much written that people are just going to like, their brains are going to explode. You know, and, the, and interestingly enough, the person who made that prediction was actually an a, um, encyclopedia publisher who ended up then creating so much information that people, you know, more information that people could consume. And at every different technical innovation we've seen with communications in, you know, in the modern era, era from 1451, you know, the invention of the printing press all the way up till now, TV, radio, um, the internet, of course, there have been people who thought that there was this information overload. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a false um, economic theory. The, to get specifically, though, <laughs> to the question <laughs> is that I think the best answer to a question is always going to find an audience. And so um, there are, I do think it's important, I started with this presentation with there's more, you know, content out there than any of us can consume. Um, the point though is that most of it never finds a home because it's it's either crap or it's, um, you know, it's created just for the sake of creating more content. Um, you know, the, I think the, the advice I would give to anyone who feels like they're in a saturated industry, I, financial services is a great example. Every bank in the world um, has, m many banks have moved into content marketing and they all want to be the number one provider of financial service education to their audience. Now all banks can't be the number one provider of financial services education. So what's happening, and this is one of my predictions for 2017, is, is brands need to find a niche a, a niche, a, a pocket of the internet that they can actually own. And, and, and it's not about who else is creating stuff. I think it should flow really from the unique expertise that companies have. Um, so I spent a lot of time in workshops creating a mission statement that specifically defines for what target audience on what topic and with what value to the customer can any brand own? What space can they become a premier destination for? Um, it, it can be, one client called it the gateway to hell, that conversation. Um, and in the end, it actually, we ended up rewriting the company mission statement overall. Their, their mission statement when we started was like, we are the premier provider of widgets. Um, and it became, we're the pr premier provider of value to this audience on this topic. And so it's about the expertise that you have that's unique to you. Um, and your company, and then you need to just start, you know, owning it and creating those great answers. I think that last point is a great, great point, because I think oftentimes when working with content marketing and developing a strategy, you start to reassess, well, what are we as a company? Who are we as a company? And how can our objectives for our business line up with our objectives for content marketing? So I think that's, that's right. Yeah, that's a very interesting point. So a question from Yasmin, she asked, where can I find good free tools or templates for mapping content to the buyer journey? Do you know of any? Yeah, so I mean, um, I, you know, I used the, the, the template that I presented here, you know, a simple, simple series of boxes. Um, Answer the public is a great one. I, I mean, it literally spells out for any keyword. And you can pick, I think they have about six or seven different major markets, US, UK, you know, Germany and a few others. Um, but that's, I think, the easiest tool. It's completely free. Um, that's specifically in, in 15 seconds of simply typing in a keyword will spit out the who, what, when, where, why, and how. Um, I use BuzzSumo. Again, you can get 20 results for free. Um, and even a subscription is just a couple, couple hundred bucks a year for, for BuzzSumo um, to reverse engineer that, that template. Um, you know, I look at the topics, the channels, the types that seem to be most relevant, and then I kind of reverse engineer that into a map based on the who, what, when, where, why, and how model. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think I, I mean, the one that I use is the one I presented here. And then I go and I use those tools like Answer the Public and BuzzSumo and Google Trends to kind of fill in the blanks. Um, my, this presentation I'll throw up on SlideShare and I have a whole bunch of others. Um, so I, I, you know, invite everyone to go check out slideshare.net forward slash Michael Brenner and you'll find a number of tips, tools, and template presentations um, that I think go a little bit deeper. Yeah, and we'll make sure to send out the SlideShare and also the recording tomorrow morning mm -hmm. for everyone so you guys can review too. So I've got um, another question. Uh, Maurice asks, when building out a new content marketing program, where should you begin? Top, middle, or bottom of the journey, and why? Hmm. 
I mean, I, I, I would start with, um, I would start with the top, but the reason I say that is only because every audit I've done and most companies that I work with have uh, the biggest gap at the top of the funnel. I think if you're a company that ha is, has already, you know, done a good job of creating content that's in the early stage, then um, the middle is really the second place to start focusing because um, the first problem that most companies have is they have too much product content. So, um, the, you know, so the first step really is in creating more of that early stage content and, and you know, you're never done when it comes to that. It's about not creating the content but building the machine that creates that content consistently at a quality level over time. Then what you find is, okay, okay, we're creating this content that maps to the early stage but we're not converting. It was, you know, the problem I found at SAP after about six months of creating, you know, pretty effective and, you know, ultimately continuously optimized early stage content was it wasn't converting. And so what we realized then was, well, we just didn't have the right stuff in the middle stage. And so we started creating ultimate guides and doing webinars and, you know, specifically tied to our top performing early stage articles. And what we found is that when we found out what resonated at the earliest stage, at the top of the funnel, and then went and created mid-stage content um, directly to that topic, we saw massive conversion rates, you know, much higher than anything else that, that we were seeing. Um, so that's where I would start. I, you know, again, assuming that you're like most companies and you have too much or you have way more product content than anyone would consume, um, I would start to, you know, fix the top of the funnel and then slowly start to think about what's the right way to get people to engage even deeper. I agree too. That's what we recommend for our clients here as well. So I'll take one more question here. Um, it says, can you explain the difference between audience segments and content marketing personas? How do you differentiate them and go deeper with the ones that you're recommending? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, again, I, it, back to that sort of second Venn diagram that I use, there's, I think there's, you know, on the circle on the left is the who and the circle on the right is the what. Um, right, and so if you're, you know, I, I think it starts first with defining that mission statement really clearly. So the mission statement, again, the formula for a mis the mission statement I use, and you probably have a similar one at Vertical Measures, is um, for which target audience can you become a premier destination? So for who, on what, to deliver what customer value? So for which audience, on what topic, and specifically what customer value can you deliver, and can you become a premier destination for it? That's the why. Um, once that's clearly articulated, you've already defined your audience segment in the who. Then you need to start focusing on the what, which is those interests, right? So. Um, what that means is, so, you know, a lot of companies I know have like 17 personas or 17 audience segments. And like at SAP, we had, a, I think we had 20. And my challenge to the organization was, what's the larger message? Who's the, the broadest possible target audience that we can re reach, but in a way that we could ultimately own them? And so we created what I called this sort of master persona. It was essentially business executives. Um, you know, we wanted to become the premier destination for business executives trying to figure out um, how technology drives innovation. So we had a very niche topic, but a very broad audience. And so I, I think it's, it's important to at least start with a very clearly defined mission statement that defines your target audience, your, your, your topics, and the value you're going to provide in some, you know, relatively broad or specific way. Um, and then start thinking about the audience's interests. So, so um, I'm not saying to throw personas out or audience segments out. I just think that that comes, uh, it really comes out of that exercise of defining your why very clearly, and then the interests from that target audience, um, and then mapping it back to the personas. Yeah, I love that defining your why. I think I think that's a good place to stop the new or start into the new year and look positively for our content marketing plans moving into that. So. Yeah, I, I and I have to. I, I know I know we're running out of time, but I have to give credit to Simon Sinek for that. Okay. Um, for his, it's it's I think the second most popular TED talk, um, and it's uh, it's I think he calls it the golden circle. But um, one of the things that Simon talks about is that the companies that succeed, they define very clearly what they believe in. And so one of my goals for 2017 is to is to actually write an article about what I believe in, what I believe. You know, I believe that marketing has a marketing problem and that we can solve it. I believe, you know, that some people can't commit to content marketing because they, they have too much of a promotional culture. So, you know, those are the kinds of things. It's a little bit of a tangent, but um, I do hope this was helpful. I'm, I'm happy to stay on and take more questions, but, uh, um, you know, I hope this was helpful for you and for everyone.
It was. Thank you. So insightful. Very helpful. And we will, like I mentioned earlier, everyone, we'll send out a recording link as well as the slide share link so you can review. Um, and if you have any questions afterwards that we didn't get to, feel free to send them over to me or Michael, and we will try to answer them as best we can. So thank you, Michael. We really appreciate you ending the year with a great webinar. And um, happy almost 12, 2017, everyone, and happy holidays.